Episode 16, The Future Ramifications of Blockchain, with Mark Risen Hopkins. Interested in Bitcoin? Bitcoin is a very vague concept to a lot of people. Need to know more about cryptocurrency? We're going to talk about the basics. You know, this is something that people just have no idea about what crypto is. How about buying, selling, and mining? Tony, I think that's one of the things that's going to make us a little different from some other shows. We're getting our hands dirty. Then listen to Gary Leland and Tony Sakala, better known as the Crypto Cousins, on the Crypto Cousins Podcast. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Welcome to the show. Gary Leland here. And this is Tony Sakala. This week's price. Today's price in Bitcoin, $11,584.20. That's down $1,686.50 since last week, or 12.8%. Wow, Tony, this is exciting times of Bitcoin. Bitcoin's going crazy. Everything's going crazy. It's up, it's down, everything's around. Um, and uh, I think that's kind of what Mark... Uh, Hopkins, our person we're interviewing today, Cousin Risen, is saying is going to happen because of blockchain. You know, Mark's been in the space a really long time. He's, uh, he, he's worked for IBM. Uh, he's a consultant with IBM, uh, one of the, the people that they turn to for future uh, insights. And uh, he, he was one of the first people who uh, told uh, you about crypto, wasn't he, a long time ago? Yes, he did. He did. It was like three hundred dollars, maybe, when he tried to get me by, and then I didn't listen. Yeah, so he's a visionary, and uh, he really sees, uh, you know, what's coming down the pike, and he knows not to get, uh, you know, freaked out when the price jumps all over the place. I think for me, uh, when the price comes down, then it's a time when we people can get back to talking about the software and talking about the technology and talking about, you know, where this can go. Uh, I think the frenzy around the price has been both good and bad for crypto because uh, it's brought in a lot of um, people who, let's just say, doing it for a kind of a get rich quick scheme. Uh, so getting back to the technology to me is exciting. And Mark is a broad thinker, a deep thinker, and uh, he really understands the space. Yeah, he does. Um he really, he really understands what's going on. He's been in it forever. And we don't want to do a lot of dilly-daddling around, as my mom would have called it, because we're trying to make these shows <laughs> shorter. But I think mm-hmm. uh, Mark has been on before. Um, you know, like Tony was saying, he's also worked as an associate editor at Mashable during its uh, formative years. Pretty smart guy, one of the smarter people I know. Um, runs Roger Wilco. So let's uh, go to the interview. Well, Cousin Mark is back. Cousin Risen, rather, should I say. Hey, Mark, thanks for joining us. You know, you are our first interview we ever had, and now we got you back again to kind of finish uh, where we were going on that conversation, I guess, right? Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, that was we, we started to touch on, like, the bigger world, and then you asked me if I had more to say, and, and, and it could have gone on for days. So now we're, we're going we're gonna to pick that back up. But not for days, are we? Well, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> No, go ahead, Mark. I'm sorry. I I can resist. Sure. Yeah. So I guess the last thing you were asking me last time we chatted, we were talking about how could you apply blockchain because we're talking about taking trust out of out of uh, you know out of kind of business situations and you know what that means and why IBM and Oracle are involved supply chain. But there's a lot of other kind of uh, interesting applications of of blockchain that touch on I think just about everything. I'm actually. I, I didn't. I didn't tell you this. It was whenever you had uh, emailed me. I guess it was a couple of weeks ago. I had just started working on a book that I think is talking is going to kind of talk about all this because I really believe that blockchain is going to transform just about every aspect of society that you can imagine. Um, and it's kind of one of those things that people, if they don't understand the technology, they can be scared by it. But I think it's largely going to be a positive change because the things that it's going to be removing from society. Uh, in my opinion, are the things that uh, a lot of people consider predatory um, or where predatory elements of society tend to live. So um, it, we'll, we'll, I'll try not to get too philosophical as we go down that rabbit hole. But uh, in general, uh, the things where I think it's gonna, we're going to see it first, like we talked about last time, supply chain, right? When you have a lot of different people, a lot of different organizations working together towards a common goal of supplying you know, a store or a facility or a you know, some sort of uh, 
value chain with with products and services. Um, you've basically got movement of physical goods, you know, sometimes across the country, sometimes across the world. All that's objectively measurable. You don't have to leave any of that up to, uh, you know, just the subjective, did it get here, did it not, you know, is it good condition or is it not? All that can be objectively measured and objectively paid out, you know, in a fair manner. Where every, most importantly, where everybody understands what the rules are, right? So um, supply chain, voting is another one. This is really fantastic. Uh, this is a really smart guy. I may, I may have him try to come on the show sometime as soon as he gets out of his research rabbit hole. He's a guy over at Princeton uh, I've known for years and years who is got, he's got a, a fellowship to study the neurological basis of free will. And what does that got to do with blockchain? Um, so in his research, he uncovered this thing called liquid democracy. Uh, liquid democracy is a, uh, a system of governance that uses cognitive and AI to kind of eliminate the polar, uh, you know, the polarization within political debate and find places where people can agree with each other. So one of the things that he, so there's, this is actually in, in active use in certain parts of the world and some certain principalities and areas in, out in Asia. And they're finding that in terms of citizen satisfaction with the government, it's at its highest of any any measurable democracy anywhere in the world throughout history is, is using this type of system. But the problem is, is there's no uh, there's no way to aside from like a voluntary participation, voluntary uh, you know, uh, participation on the government side. There's no way to kind of incentivize participation in it other than you know we just want to have a good government. So there's elements. Uh, that are out in California that are coming kind of out of the, the Bernie Sanders group uh, you know, constituency that are marrying the idea of this liquid democracy with blockchain. So they're going to be doing token-based participation where not only do we have perhaps a better way of coming to consensus using technology, but there's a financial incentive for the participants to remain invested in the solution. So there's, there's two like polar opposite examples of things that could transform i'll let you guys kind of direct the, the direction where we want to take this freewheeling conversation one of the yeah, the the whole idea of democracy and bringing the power to people and voice to people who don't have it is uh, one of the overarching topics that andreas antonopoulos talks about when That's he right. uh, talks about bitcoin uh bringing uh the unbanked uh, to the financial services, what is it? It's about six billion people really underbanked or unbanked. Uh, what What are your thoughts on that whole movement? Does that mean people who don't have bank accounts, the unbanked? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Just want to yeah. make sure I was on the same page. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's kind of like uh, people that don't have bank accounts and aren't likely to get bank accounts for of you know a pantheon of reasons. Uh, look at look at India for for an example or. You know, rural parts of Africa where the banking infrastructure maybe simply does not exist or in India it does exist but it's only accessible to certain cross sections of society um, I think uh, I'm, ho- I'm hoping I'm not mangling the quote but uh, I think it was Bill Gates that said that blockchain and Bitcoin represents the, the first uh, uh, fundamental uh, piece of now I am totally mangling the quote but basically <laughs> In reference to the unbanked, in reference to foreign remittance, he, he made a statement, uh, and this would have been at least three years ago, maybe four years ago, talking about how it represents a fundamental shift in uh, you know, the, the balance of power and towards individual freedom. And that's really what it represents. I don't think that banks will completely disappear, though, um, at least not for the foreseeable future. I do think that banking as we know it will be a completely separate institution. Um, I don't think, you know, you go downtown near where my office is, is you can, you know, you throw a rock out any direction from our building, you're going to hit a 80 story plus building that's got a bank's name on it, right? It's a Chase Bank of America, America. So I don't think those banks will exist in 15 years. That's a bold prediction, but I think they're going to be gone as we know. Like wow. the, the brand may still exist in some shape, form or capacity. But Bank of America Tower won't be Bank of America Tower, and Comerica Tower will be Comerica. That would be pretty quick, 15 years. I think it's going to be that quick. So, uh, think- you know, I was watching a thing the other day on Bitcoin, and it showed the ma- uh, globe of the earth, where had banks were frequent, where we are, they're on every corner like you're saying, and it had lit up where there were banks freely here, UK, 
Australia, and it, the rest of the world was dark. Man, over half the planet doesn't have banking systems in place. I, I didn't realize that. I thought banks were everywhere just like they were here. Well, so here's, here's where I think it's going to transform. I think the number of banks will actually go up by probably, you know, some, some factorial. And it will light up the rest of the world that you saw in that globe picture that it'll be worldwide, right? But it won't be Bank of America. It won't be Texas Legacy Bank. It won't even be like, you know, the, the, you know your, pick your favorite credit union. It's going to be, you know, Bank of Gary serving the greater three block radius of his neighborhood because he's the guy on his block that everybody knows. He's the guy who understands what cryptocurrency is. And they come to him for his tough problem. So you're, hey, saying, you you're saying they'll be that small. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's going to be friends and family banking. And credit will be extended because I know you and I give you credit because I know you're going to come. It's not going to be based on like an Equifax situation. It's going to be based on like, hey, I I know Gary. Yeah, I'll lend Gary 10 grand or 500 bucks or whatever it is he's asking for because I know he's good for it or I won't. Right. Based upon what I think your credit is. Wow, that's a drastic change in banking in 15 years. I, I agree. And, it's the, and the, but then the question is, and this is the next logical question if I'm saying that's what banking is. Next logical question is, well, what do you do if you want to buy a house? Is, is, is Mark going to lend Gary you know, a couple hundred grand so he can go buy a house? Well, probably not. What about a business loan? You know, is, is, am I going to lend somebody you know, $500,000 or a million dollars or $5 million in VC? No. But we do have this new capital structure called ICOs that are perfect for raising money for businesses. And, and for those who don't know, what does ICO stand for? And I do know this, but... <laughs> ICO stands for Initial Coin Offering. And it's a, it's a perfect way to instrument corporate governance using blockchain. Um, the SEC is kind of advising against that particular application right now because they don't like the competition. But that's exactly what this thing was designed for and exactly what it will be used for. Yeah, when when people think about money as a, as a merchant, you know, we sell things online. Gary does, I do. Uh, the The relationship between our customer and uh, the uh, the payment solution is is uh, you know someone's in the middle. You got PayPal, you got a bank, you got Authorize.net, you've got Stripe, you've got all these companies in the middle. And uh, as we've known over the years. Uh, someone makes too much money too quickly, uh, those institutions freeze accounts. They, PayPal's got a horrible reputation for that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it just f- seems like the peer-to-peer element of Bitcoin and the uh, other cryptos uh, really lead to a disintermediation uh, of all that sort of thing. Uh, what is your viewpoint there? Well, I mean, I think you've nailed it. Um, I think that's why... Uh, I think that's why consumers will continue to adopt it at the rate that they're adopting it. I think the reason why banks will adopt it and bring about their own demise is for an entirely different reason. Um, it's it's related, but it's not. A, so if you are the largest of the large banks, like if you're Bank of America or Bank of New York or Santander or Deutsche Bank or any of those world-class banks, right, That uh, then you are a participant in essentially – you know, the international wire transfer system. And it's an incredibly archaic system that requires a lot of trust, a lot of uh, paperwork. Uh, and like, if you're an individual member of that, like if you're Deutsche Bank or Bank of New York, you can count on just maintaining your piece of that essentially large bank PayPal system up to cost you multiple billions of year. So the reason why you see banks of that size currently adopting blockchain technologies like Ripple and Ethereum is, is, is simply as a cost-saving measure. They recognize the value. Of we can eliminate $3 billion in cost a year for this one bank if we collectively decide to switch to a blockchain. I and, see. From the enterprise perspective, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, you know, I noticed that if you use like Bitcoin, take Bitcoin on your site, uh, with BitPay, you are, you are using Coinbase or whatever, you're paying 1% fee for mm-hmm. trading that Bitcoin into dollars instead of 3.5% or something that you have to pay uh, a company for the credit card. Right. That's a substantial savings if you're doing a million dollars in business a year. Well, but you're, you're also ignoring the hidden savings in that, um, which mo- many people find unbelievable. But you guys have both run e-commerce websites 
where you've ex- through a clearinghouse accepted credit cards, and so you you buy, you both understand the value uh, lost through credit card fraud. Yes, yes. That's I was thinking of that last night when someone told me this statement. I said, "But how about like every time I lose a five hundred dollars sale because it was shipped to a, an apartment complex or something, and the guy knew the guy wouldn't be home during the day, and the guy they leave it on the por- porch and he stole it or a stolen credit card." I mean, yeah, there is no stolen credit cards. You've already got your money, right? And, and some businesses, some businesses that are in particularly high risk areas, like. Uh, uh, credit repair, uh, pornography, or uh, I'm trying to think of a couple other ones besides just those two. But there's there's like a class of businesses that credit card merchant services will you know either bill at a higher rate or not accept at all. Right, because of the risk. Right, because of the risk, and they, they're typically hard hit. Fifteen to twenty percent uh, uh, it, it, of of all transactions that go through those types of businesses, you can expect to be lost to fraud. It's like we won't ship two bats. To any customer in the state of Florida or California, right. if, if it's more than one, they probably stole someone's credit card and they're getting two bats. Now I'll do it in Texas; I won't have a problem. But if it goes to Florida, California, I've been burnt so many times I don't even want to sell. Right, right. Well, and if you're trying to sell drugs on the internet, then PayPal and the other processors really don't want to touch what you're doing. Uh, I, I sell diet drugs, and uh, it's been it's been challenging. Uh, the drugs are legal, but they're maybe not well accepted. Right, right, and 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 so anything that's new or interesting or different is gonna is gonna ping the risk profile of of and and let's let's be fair for good reason, right? Like there's there's a good reason because if you're an emergent processor, you're the guy in the middle that's assuming all the risk because you're trusting both the person selling in the merchant services position that they're not doing things that are shady and people that are in new innovative types of businesses often are are you know not often but they can be you know they can also be slim slam artists, right? I mean people that that was the whole thing that caused the dot com crash is you know every Everybody understood that Silicon Valley was doing something awesome. And then all the, the, the Slim Slam guys came in and said, well, we can make up words too. And they raised a whole bunch of money for things that never existed. So there's that side that merchant services have to trust. And there's the other side where they have to trust that uh, you know, the people making the purchases aren't doing so with stolen numbers. And you know, it's, it's a flawed, it's a deeply flawed system at every level. And there's, it's, it's, a, it's a miracle it works at all. That, that makes sense. Yeah. I'll tell you what, I like the blockchain. I like the idea of that, of uh, credit card. That's a, not losing money for stolen credit cards. Right. I'm going to go pink on that idea. So um, you, you covered voting. You covered purchasing. Mm-hmm. You covered banking. Right. I mean, you're pretty much covering everything that we do in life is going to be changed by the block. Right. Well, let's, let's talk about government. Let's talk about the idea of government fundamentally uh, disappearing to the edges of society, right? Now that's that's a bold statement, right? Mm-hmm. So there is a group. Uh, well, I mean, this is this has been a concept that's been evolving for probably twenty years. It's, a, it's the idea of crypto anarchy, um, but it, it, with the introduction of the concept of blockchain to this uh, ideology, it's taken it to uh, it's taken it from the realm of science fiction to the possibility of science fact. Um, so let's take a really practical example where government kind of sucks in the modern day. Uh, and it, I'll, I'll pick something non-controversial. Everybody can agree that, you know, road construction blows at every level. Like, it's just not good. It's just, it, it, it's, it stinks when you need it and it stinks when it's happening. And usually by the time it's finished, it, it still stinks, right? Everybody hates that, that sector of government service, right? We can agree. Part of, part, part of the reason why is because it takes so long to get anything done. Like, let's take 635, the, the, essentially the loop that goes around Dallas. 635, let's, uh, let's say that it was riddled with potholes. They just finished it, so it's not. But right, let's say it's riddled with potholes. Nobody likes driving on it. Um, businesses are suffering. People are having to take side roads for commute. It's just a bad deal all around. So what happens? So people get fed up. They bring it to city council. City council forms a committee committee thinks about it they come up with a solution solution is probably going to be raise a bond raise a tax then the council has to vote on it oftentimes if the tax is big enough they are you know maybe they have a referendum because the plan wasn't good i mean 
-hmm. just coming to agreement that yes, we need to do something and here's a plan to do it and here's how we're going to pay for it. That could easily be a five to 10 year process, just identifying the problem and doing something about it. Mm -hmm. And then we can kind of all also universally agree that raising taxes and bonds, if you don't believe in a project, kind of sucks as a concept too, because I don't like paying for taxes. I pay a lot of taxes. I mean, Texas is a tax-friendly state, but still, there's a lot of taxes I pay, and the less the better. So what if you could uh, voluntarily choose to create, uh, to create a fund for that without having to go through any of that bureaucracy? That is possible with blockchain. So the second blockchain that was ever implemented uh, after Bitcoin was one called DevCoin. So DevCoin was created as a proof of concept that would allow for the raising of funds to support open source projects and open source documentation. The way it works was it was also run on the SA256 uh, mining scheme, which meant it could be merged mined with Bitcoin. So uh, Gary, I don't know if you're doing this, but if you're not, you want to look into it on your Bitcoin mining. You can usually click a checkbox somewhere that says also merge mine DevCoin. And you get a few extra pennies every time you guys solve a block. What's happening there is uh, there it functions on many of the same principles as, Dev, as, as Bitcoin, except for every time there's a block solved, instead of all the miners getting 100% of the rewards, 70% of the value generated by solving a block goes into a central fund that's controlled by the DevCoin Foundation, which then parses it out open source projects and open source documentation writers. Oh, that's fascinating. I hadn't really uh, th heard of that. Right. Well, I mean, so let's take it back to DFW coin, or sorry, uh, 635 coin for our, from our mythical example here. Instead of going through that long bureaucratic process of raising taxes or bonds or whatever, we could create a, a, a an ICO uh, of, of sorts that call it 635 coin, 30% of everything mined, or in all 30% of all transaction fees go into a central fund. The central fund, we could even get fancy with it and have like a, uh, a crypto governed bidding process using smart contracts and whoever comes out there with the right plan and people could use a proof of stake to vote on the right. You can make the thing completely democratic, completely voluntary. Then you go out and you take 635 coin, you stump up and down using to, uh, going up and down the businesses that have their, you know, their, their livelihood based upon access to that highway. Say, hey, you want to accept this uh, cryptocurrency in your in your business? Every time someone makes a transaction with 635 coin, it'll go put a you know, put a fraction of that into the coffers to repairing the the, the road that's causing you so much headache. Right? And you do the same thing, and that kind of helps spread the word. You do the same thing with the you know, the neighborhoods of people that try to use 635. Yeah. And pretty soon, you've got people voluntarily opting into a, what is essentially a tax, but it's a voluntary tax to solve their own problem. And you've completely circumvented the entire process of going through a city council, you know, 20 miles away that isn't necessarily affected by the problem. So we're really seeing the uh, application of the libertarian ideals of voluntarism and uh, people working together in their own self-interest to further the community. Right. I mean, this is this, this is the promise of the of the idea. Yes. Wow. Well, that's a lot to take in all you said there. And is that also going to happen quickly, like the banking system? I, I think um, I think not. I think you're going to see blockchain take over in a lot more commercial aspects of life. Where, and you're going to people have to they, they don't they need to see it to believe it. Right. So you guys are kind of you're you're at the stage where you're you're using it. You're seeing the positive results of using blockchain in a small scale. You're 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 it, you're, you're, you're looking at implementing it in your businesses, in your personal life, uh, to varying degrees. Rest of America right now is just at the what is what is blockchain, right? They're at that what is blockchain stage. So this is so like 1996 was for the internet in blockchain. Right, right. And how long after the internet was was brought to brought to bear on commerce did it take for Washington D.C. to adopt it for governmental process? Yeah. Wow. Mm. So, yes, for a while. So so this is kind of like uh, just a forming. And, and there'll be things that come out right now then, like pets.com. That was a great concept. And now you have petsmarts.com. It was just too early. Right, right. And so we'll have things come out now that'll be too early, won't we? Absolutely. I mean, you're, al you're already seeing, you know, the, the, the failure. I mean, DevCoin, DevCoin 
in a sense, is a failure and it's also a success, right? It's a failure in the fact that, I mean, you guys know what open source software is. You, you use tons of different open source software and you've never heard of DevCoin. That means they haven't truly succeeded at their stated goal, which is to support open source software with a blockchain. But their proof of concept work on small scale and it serves as a model for something that we can do in the future, which is way too early. There is too many quirks to the implementation. But so it's a, it's a success in one sense and it's a failure in another. And we're going to see tons of that, just like you said. And it also seems that uh, the applications that run on top of the blockchain really probably haven't been invented that are going to transform our lives uh, even further. Uh, we don't really have the imagination yet to know what's and, to come. And I would think the things that are being built, how do you know that one of those things we think are real hot right now are not the MySpace of the blockchain? <laughs> you know, while it seems really great now, in five years, the Facebook of the blockchain comes out and everybody's going, MySpace of the blockchain, who's using that? Right, right. Well, you know, I mean, we, we say Bitcoin has hit cruising altitude. And, and, and the genie's out of the bottle, but there's still a lot of ways that Bitcoin could kill itself, right? And that, and, and that would be a, certainly a large setback for uh, cryptocurrency in general, but it wouldn't mean the death of the concept. Um, it, uh, if for, for those who have been in cryptocurrency for less than, uh, I don't know, I would say four years, that didn't, I, I got into it in 2011. I suffered through the whole MT Gox disaster, and I had to just keep my mouth shut as people on a daily basis predicted the demise of Bitcoin, not even understanding what that means just because some guy in Japan pulled off a fraud. Did you have money right? in Mt. Gox? <laughs> Surprisingly, no. Actually, I was an active user of Mt. Gox, but for completely unrelated reasons, I decided to pull my money out about three or four months before it all fell apart. Hmm. Ah, good, well, good for, you. for you. Fantastic. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, I would love to say I saw the writing on the wall on that, but it was just like I, I didn't need to use it for any purpose anymore. And I decided to put all my stuff into a, a, a you know, client side wallet because I felt it was a better, better security system. So what are, what are you saying for people who haven't been in it that long? Well, what I'm saying is that there will be because this is an unregulated market, there will be black swan events and they will feel like the end of the world. And I'm here to tell you that they are not. So I think, um, and, and I, don't, I don't know, I don't know how many people listening will agree, and I don't know how many people in the, in, in, uh, in the world would agree with this, but it is my opinion that the, the disaster of MT Gox, I, mean, I can't overstate how big of a disaster that was. MT Gox consisted of 70% of all Bitcoin transactions at that time. And that, that was an incredible amount of centralization. It's supposed to be a decentralized system. Um, and when they went under, um, you know, it was. It would be as if every. It would be as if the bailout did not occur in 2008, and all of our major banking institutions essentially went out of business on the same day. Imagine the effect on the economy at large in that instance. That's what happened with MP Gox. So, um, so you're saying it can't get much worse than 70 percent of the Bitcoin in existence disappearing. Correct. Right. And so. What I think uh, the, the, the point that I'm taking too long to come around to is that it's a testament to how uh, markets can be self-repairing uh, if you let them stay unregulated and stay, you know, if you don't pursue a bailout. There was no bailout for MT Gox. Nobody bailed the Bitcoin holders out. Like their money was gone. It, was, it sucked. A lot of people lost a lot of fortune, but it happened. But Bitcoin as a protocol, Bitcoin as a market recovered. And so, um, I'm not, I, I don't think it's going to happen. I don't know what it would be if it did happen. But let's say Bitcoin, something similar happened and Bitcoin just cratered. Right? It would not be the end of blockchain. There are many, many other technologies waiting in the wings to, 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 to step up to the plate and be the dominant cryptocurrency. And I don't think there would ever need to be a bailout in such an event. I think everybody would, there would be some carnage, but people would recover. There's, there's a web page on Bitcoin Talk that uh, lists the major Bitcoin heists, and, and the list goes on and on. I mean, it's just there have been many, many, many thefts and losses and, and incredible. Uh, so really, we've been through uh, an 
an incredible amount of what you call black swan events and Bitcoin, as uh, they say, it's like the honey badger. It just keeps on going. <laughs> exactly. Well, and there's a, there's a key lesson that can be learned from 100% of those heists. I mean, I, I, without exception. And the key lesson is this decentralized. Do not trust. Trust is a weakness. And, and in the world of blockchain, the world of business, there's no reason to trust somebody to hold your Bitcoin for you. If you, uh, if you have the ability to spend a couple days you know, reading documentation on how to manage your own money, there's no reason to trust somebody else in this respect. And Gary every- just finished uh, doing his hardware wallet. You want to share that? Yeah, I did that last one well, night for last. It uh, took me a little while to figure out. Uh, I have a Trezor. Is it a Trezor? Mm-hmm. And uh, it took me a little while to figure it out. And after I got it done, I was kind of going, what was so hard about that? Why did it take me so long to figure it out? But yeah, it's a pretty simple process now. I mean, I had some more funds in uh, my Coinbase account come in today. I'll be transferring those tonight. It takes like uh, 30 seconds. I mean, it's not very difficult to do. And then you've right. got your, your words, all your code words or whatever. So you even if you lost your wallet, you could uh, still get yeah, it back. It. So. I'm kind of mm-hmm. excited about that. I feel like I'm pretty protected. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, we're Mark, we're cousin Mark, we're hitting that 30 minute mark again. <laughs> and you know, we well, uh, by the time Tony and I talk a little bit before and after, we're talking close to 45 minutes, and that's the point we got to start cutting this off. We're going to have to bring you back again in the future, though, Mark. I, you know, you know, I love to do it. You can't shut me up when I start talking about this stuff. So you know, anytime, anytime you want to have me on, I'll, I'm happy to come. I think uh, I think we had a great time. Uh, we covered a lot of ground. Let's just look forward to having you back, Mark. Hey, Mark, how can uh, is there anything you want to uh, add before we get out of here? Well, how can people uh, how can people find you or see what you're up to, Mark? Sure, uh, my website rizzn.com is where I've been blogging since the '90s. Uh, I have a uh, website specifically for blockchain and Bitcoin stuff called AskDrBitcoin.com. It's the same stuff on the personal blog, but just the Bitcoin part. And then my company, Roger Wilco dot agency, occasionally will produce some content at reports around Bitcoin and blockchain. Cool. Well, Mark, I personally want to tell you thanks for coming on, cousin Risen. I do appreciate it. And uh, as always, you are a ton of knowledge. A ton of knowledge, especially for someone like me. And uh, I, I hope that uh, that not slow down our audience, me stopping you to ask these questions that I don't know, and they probably all do. Absolutely. But, but Mark, thanks again for joining us. Until next time, we'll see you later, guy. Hey, I hope you enjoyed today's interview. And the thing about that interview, I forgot to give it a, a disclaimer there in the beginning, Tony. That was when I first, that was before we did our first episode. And I'd been in, I had been in crypto like two weeks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You had a lot of questions. Yeah, I had a lot of questions. I didn't understand a lot of stuff. So people who listen to that probably the whole time they were listening here going, God, I thought Gary was smarter than this dude. But that is the <laughs> last of our old interviews that we had in the can, so to speak. So um, so hopefully if you've been listening, you know that I know more now than I did then. Because I really am embarrassed by this. But the information is so good. I'm just embarrassed about how, how much I did not know. Well, I think it's amazing how much you've learned. I mean, you just soaked it up like a sponge listening to podcasts. If the podcast is the podcast. So, I mean, you pretty much know more than uh, most people on the planet uh, about crypto. And I think that some of the times we come across as, you know, we're, we're asking the easy questions. We're asking questions that kind of leading questions so that people can, can understand. But I think uh, you're one of the uh, maybe uh, smartest, brightest people who really understands that the newbie needs to ask uh, and understand things from a basic level. And and uh, I saw your presentation the other day at a local meetup, and boy, it was amazing. Uh, you really clarified things for the newbies uh, where I would have uh, obfuscated it <laughs> with a lot of jargon. Well, it's just according to how you think. I mean, you uh, think I think more technical terms than I do, and I think more— uh, I do love to dive in. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's why we work out so well, Tony, is that we both look at things from different angles. I mean, we both come up with mm-hmm. the same conclusions, but we both think of things in different ways, maybe. Um, so, um, but I thought that was a great information that uh, that Riz was giving us there. I really do. And I want to make sure everybody also knows about uh, we're uh, up for the crypto 
uh, top a blockchain journalist awards. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so if anyone wants to check that out or vote on us, you can vote on us once a day. Um, it's according to when you're listening to this. <laughs> if you're listening to this too late, it might already be over, and we might have made it, might not. But go to CryptoCousins.com slash vote and vote for us as the top blockchain journalist is the category. Did want to get that out there. And uh, anything particular you want to mention before we get out of here, Tony? We're trying to keep these short shows short, which we never do. But anything <laughs> that you want to mention? Uh, probably uh, where, where you're listening, uh, go to Meetup. Try to find your local Meetup group. Uh, there are a lot of people in the space that have been meeting for years, and uh, we we run a Meetup. Gary and I run a local Meetup for both Dallas, Fort Worth, for Dallas and Arlington, Fort Worth area, and uh, that's where you'll meet some of the more interesting folks. We've met people who are running uh, mining pools. Uh, when I asked which one, the guy said, I'm not going to tell you. So it's a very secretive space. <laughs> and if you can get into uh, a meetup and start talking with people, uh, you'll learn a whole, whole lot more. We've met people who own uh, Bitcoin ATMs, big people who do local Bitcoin, buying and selling hundreds of thousands of Bitcoin. You know, they bring with them like a big, strong guy uh, to make sure that the cash is, uh, you know, properly transferred. Lots of interesting things. Uh, we met a NASA scientist, somebody who's working on like a Mars rover, and uh, he's talking with us about uh, buying an Ethan. There's now only a couple left, <laughs> so maybe all sold out by now. But uh, yeah, so that's the best thing. Get out with your local group, meet the local people, and uh, you'll learn a lot more. Yeah, that's a good information there for sure, Tony. Yeah. And uh, don't forget to uh, go to Facebook and check out and join our group or our page. We have both on there. Just search CryptoCousins.com or just Crypto Cousins, and you'll find us on either one of those two uh, things. And um, I really don't have a whole bunch to say. Like I said, I want to—I really am working on keeping these shows shorter. Um, you may want to check if you have a question or a comment. Give us a call at 747 777 9471 747 777-9471. If you have a question or anything you want to go over or, or comment you want to make, please do it. And uh, check out, uh, if you're listening to this to us on our site or on a website, check out CryptoCousins.com slash iTunes if you have an Apple device or CryptoCousins.com slash Spotify if you have an Android device. But that's about all I really had today, Tony. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll wrap it up. Okay, well, that's it for uh, coming out of the... Crypto Cousin Studios in uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. This is Gary Leland saying adios, muchachos. So long. Thanks for listening to the Crypto Cousins podcast. Please share this podcast with anyone you know that is interested in cryptocurrency. Your friends can subscribe on iTunes at CryptoCousins.com slash iTunes and on Android at CryptoCousins.com slash play. If you want to know more about Tony or Gary, just go to TonySicala.com or GaryLeland.com. Make sure and join us on the next episode, and thanks for listening. The Crypto Cousins podcast and information in the podcast are not intended as investment advice. Cryptocurrencies are risky. Never invest more than you can afford to lose. Always seek professional advice before making any investment. Investing in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies may present tremendous risks. Please understand that you are using any and all information available on or through the Crypto Cousins podcast at your own risk. 